up next is Illa Prinz. And Illa studied civil engineering in Germany and graduated with a Bachelor of Engineering in 2010. After his graduation, he spent six years in structural engineering. In 2016, Illa joined CDM Smith Europe and is currently responsible for the application of BIM and state-of-the-art technologies in project as head of BIM and digital design in Europe. And so with that, uh, please welcome Ilya. Thanks. So, um, since it's late and you saw a lot of slides today, I tried to keep my slides with uh, as little text as possible. So what I brought with me is just nice, nice looking pictures, videos, and entertainment. So what I'm going to talk about today is, um, I will talk about building information modeling. Uh, I think not everyone is familiar with that. I will tell you about a project that we're working on um, called Schacht Konrad. I will use it in German language. And then I will um, talk about the BIM implementation in that particular project. This is where are the, the good looking pictures, videos, and entertainment comes. Before that, uh, if, you, if you're interested, let's get involved. So pick up your smartphone, scan that QR code, and you'll be directed to a homepage where there you can either see polls, questions like when, when I'm asking you something, you can vote, or you can ask questions about whatever you see, whatever is on the slide, and I will see them here immediately, so I can answer them to them uh, also immediately. So, people are coming. Hopefully this QR codes works, yeah? yeah? Very good, very good. Okay, let's start with the first question. On a scale of one to five, how familiar are you with building information modeling? Wait a second. Does it work? Technology. Why is it not working? All right, let's do it like this. Technology doesn't work. Hands up. <laughs> Very good. Who is familiar with building information modeling? One person? Oh, that's a good ratio. <laughs> All right. Let's go into building information modeling. I have a definition for building information modeling brought here from the national bimstandards.org. Uh, I don't want to read it aloud. You can, you can read it yourself. Um, basically, in, in my words, building information modeling is not a tool, it's not a software. It's a method. It's a technique of designing things, of, co of collaborating and working together. And where it comes from? It comes from a uh, vertical industry, uh, mainly. So in buildings, you have different layers. It starts with structural, architectural, or architectural, structural, MEP, HVAC. And <clears throat> before BIM, it was all coordinated in 2D, just drawings. And of course, there were a lot of misunderstandings and errors. So what BIM does, it, it puts the 3D model, the building information model, in the center of the design process. And based on that, um, you do design, you feed it with information, but you also take out the information. Um, BIM in all life cycles. So that's the idea. If you have a building information model, you can use it for all life cycles or all steps in the life cycle, starting from the first idea, from the first draft, over the design, the uh, construction, commissioning, maintenance, operation, and even uh, dismantling. So, I'm pushing buttons here, it doesn't work. Exactly. What does it mean exactly and how does it work? This is. A couple of minutes that I would like to spend so that you 
better understand why we are doing what we are doing in that particular project. So if you look at the classic design, you have a couple of, um, let's say, people involved. You, s you have architects, you have the client, MEP, HVC that I mentioned already. You have construction uh, service. And the way how they used to communicate and to coordinate was with, I call it different languages, different file formats, different types. So there were Excel spreadsheets. That's like the best friend of every en engineer is an Excel spreadsheet. That's where everything starts. They even write letters in Excel spreadsheet. So you have Word documents, you have GIS, you have PDF, and of course, if you try to, to coordinate it and to coordinate the information uh, from, from that process, you have different languages that you speak, and that opens uh, space for, let's call it interpretation, and then, of course, collision. So what happens in the BIM approach? <clears throat> like I mentioned, the building information model is put in the center of the whole process. And everyone is communicating, not with different formats, but is kind of putting information into that model and taking it out of it. And what you see here, like those beautiful um, file type images, this is uh, IFC, IFC's industry foundation classes, which is a common standard, which is not a um, kind of an open standard. It, it's not <clears throat> binded to any software. So this is a way of communicating easily um, on a design process. So what happens if you have one language? Of course, there is you create a single source of truth digitally first, and then you copy it into in the real environment. And that is, that is the approach of building information modeling. And I said it, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not a software or a tool or something. Um, and the reason for that is because it, it kind of concerns every, every part in um, what, what is on this slide. So it, it has a lot to do with processes. How is information exchanged? How do I, I, do I as a designer, provide my information? How do I take information from that particular building information modeling that I require? It has to do a lot with people because they have to be trained. They have to use this software. They have to use this technology. And of course, standards. So just to give you an example that building information modeling is not only for vertical buildings. What you see here is a project of um, CDM Smith where we are uh, designing the subsurface infrastructure, like all these cable ducts and uh, manholes and, and pipes, or the, the whole dewatering system. We use it in geotech. This is a retaining wall with, um, I think that's somewhere in, in, in Riga, with geotech style. This is a fish pass that we designed all, also with, building, uh, with BIM models. And now we do it in mining. But before I come to the project in mining, here are some general advantages. And actually, there are a couple of, and I mean, maybe, maybe you heard that the collaboration is the most important thing in, in a design process. And if you have one single source of information, that, of course, improves the collaboration in, uh, tremendously. Um, you can use the model to take out quantities, because the model it has not just the ge uh, geometrical information, but also the alphanumerical information. You can say, give me all the columns in this type, concrete, and so on and so forth, and it will give you the amount of it. You can use it for visualizations and simulations, um, which increases the transparency in wherever you require it, be it with uh, public relations or uh, just decision making. But of course, that reduces errors and risks, and let's say, in the best case, <laughs> you have a faster project delivery. OK, well, we don't try that. We just make it by hand again. Um, so rate the applicability of build, uh, building information modeling in mining. What do you think? Hands up who thinks that it is applicable there? Oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. So before I come to the... Um, to the details of what we did with building information modeling in Conrad, I would like to tell you something about the project itself. So um, the project is called Conrad. And um, first of all, the client. The client is BGE, 
that stands for Bundesgesellschaft für Endlagerung. <laughs> Try to say that. Um, which is translated the Federal Company for Radioactive Waste Disposal. They were founded in 2016, and um, they are actually managing or currently designing and coordinating the, um, all the repository projects in Germany. And that project, uh, Conrad, is the first official repository in Germany for low and intermediate level nuclear wastes uh, in, in Germany, in Salzgitter. In Salzgitter. So, and um, when this is done and the project is ready, they plan to store their approximately 300,000 cubic meters, which will be th almost 400 cubic yards of nuclear waste. So, this is Conrad, this is the mine. It looks small from on this image, but if we go underground, you will see the whole structure. So Conrad is a uh, former uh, iron ore mine. It was uh, operated back then, I think even before the war, the Second World War. And what you see here is the whole structure, and it has a, um, a size of, let's say, two and a half kilometer, which would be, I don't know what in miles, but approximately like this diagonally. So you see there are only two entrances. On the left, this is Conrad 1. On the right is Conrad 2. And the, um, the project or the, the example that I'm going to talk about is this small part here. And this is just the beginning. This was the, the beginning of the project itself. And now we are uh, facing, let's say, the whole asset doing and building information modeling. Just to give you a map. This is the overview. There are, um, it, is, it is small. I mean, this is, those are the um, current and future disposal chambers. Um, so the mine workings are still going. And here is, let's call, let's call the heart of Conrad, where all, all the operations is, where you have workshops, where you have the backfill preparation, and so on and so forth. Now just a smaller map to get a better understanding. This is the so-called Füllort, what I'm going to talk about. And this is the future, future part here, like workshop, workshop area, backfill preparation, and so on. So what are the challenges in this project? And why is our client um, interested? Or why is he using or asked us to, to uh, implement building information modeling? We have a tight time schedule, so the commissioning for Conrad is set for 2027, which is in four years. Um, we are in a mining environment. You, you saw there were only two shafts going down. So whatever you design, whatever you build down there has to be perfectly designed. Because if there is an error, then it's kind of you know, a big deal then. <laughs> so and what? The biggest challenge for our client is, is the amount of specialist planners. So each and every equipment ha is, is designed by another company. And there's actually no one coordinating beside uh, the, the client. So they, they're coordinating it. And they used to coordinate it. Or oh, that is now we're coming to, to, to BIM uh, in, in, in Conrad. That is a beautiful visualization. They used to coordinate it like this. I think you're all familiar with drawings, uh, layout, cross-section. And this is how they started communicating all the specialist planners. And I said, when I saw that, I was like, this is crazy. This is ne never, ever going to work out because there's so many, you know, it's all in a, in a danced area. There are a lot of, there's a lot of equipment. Um, yeah, this is how it all started. It all started with an informal conversation with the client about, about the challenges and the let's say, the challenges in the complex mining environment with the limited access, or limited accessibility and material supply issues. And then um, we just started doing building information modeling in an ongoing project. So usually, usually when you start a project and you apply building or implement building information modeling, you have 
let's say, the um, employer's requirement, you have a BIM execution plan, you, you have standards for that project. There was nothing like that. There were only 3D models from the designers, and that's it. So this is how it went. This is the final result, what you see. It is a BIM model, coordinated with BIM model, um, which means that all, the, all this equipment is coordinated in the in, um, in sense of size and distance to each other. So um, what are we going to improve the process? So first of all, we started, I call it remodeling. It's, it's actually bad, bad English. But we create BIM models because not all design uh, or not all designers working in 3D in 2023. That's crazy for me. I don't understand that, but it still is the case. So we kind of create the models so we can coordinate them. We do, and in my opinion, that is the biggest advantage in the design process when you use building information modeling is model coordination or model-based clash detection. So what you see here is an automate, um, automized clash detection. You see it here. There is a yellow dot, which is an issue pinned to the model. And you have the issue description here. So you can figure out where the equipment intersects or collides with each other. Or it doesn't even have to be a hard clash. It can be a soft clash, like a distance is not kept. So we use that to um, kind of even out the small mistakes in, in, in the coordination. The next thing we do is so-called 4D simulation. That is, um, I mean, it's phasing. You take a schedule of the project, you uh, kind of glue it to the model, and then you do the simulation. Instead of explaining too much, I just brought a video with me. So what, what you see here is um, phasing. You see that's the schedule here. Uh, the tasks it can be a Microsoft project or Primavera, whatever, um, and it's it's connected to the to the building or the, to the three D elements and then simulated. So what you can see here, I mean, this is a clash free thing because we we kind of um, worked long on that on on the schedule, so it worked. But if you visualize a schedule like that you will see clashes in the schedule immediately. If you just look at the schedule, it's just you know this waterfall diagram and you don't see anything. If you do that right, you can um, kind of get rid of the small mistakes that you might do in, in uh, while scheduling. And of course, it's an impressive simulation to show. OK, go to the next slide. Um, impressive simulations. Visualization and um, so since this is a tax money project, let's call it like that. Uh, the, the the client has there's a lot of work in in um, stakeholder management, engagement, public relations, and so on. So they are absolutely happy to have videos like that explaining the process. What is going to happen down there? Why are we spending millions of, of euros um, in that process? So what you see here is actually a container with a radio, radioactive waste going from vertical transportation into horizontal. And then there is a crane. And this, it's called a truck. It's just a simple visualization of the process, but it creates so much value for someone who is not into that project, who is not deeply involved in, in all these processes, and creates just a better understanding. And that is all possible just because we have this coordinated BIM model. We went further. So what we are doing, and it started in COVID times, we are doing VR model reviews. So our client has VR goggles, two of them. We have a couple of them. So instead of meeting and having, or at least looking at the screen, we are walking virtually in that model and looking, you know, discussing things in that model. So what you see here in the picture, that is our client. And I did the screenshot while uh, we were in, in this model. And we were measuring stuff. And the interesting thing here is you can create issues 
kind of a documentation of, of um, the issues you see in the model itself and then just you know work them off and, and or work with them afterwards. That is a very interesting thing. And it creates a value. And I would say for me it wasn't obvious until um, the client asked us to do so. He said, please, can we have some drawings derived from the uh, coordinated model? I was like, sure, of course, we can. And the reason for that is there are no model or no drawings that are coordinated like that. So each and every designer has its own you know, drawings. And someone was flipping drawings back and forth. And this was the first time when all equipment and everything that, that is going to be uh, constructed down there were all in one drawing. And that helped our cli client extremely in the um, communications with the designer. Because he could show the drawing and say, look, here is an issue. Let's discuss that. Because not everyone wants to be in 3D. That's still the case. So uh, I asked. Our client said, come on, give me some testimonials. What do you think about what are the, the real benefits and improvements in Conrad that, that, that we did? And um, number one was the, the transparency that we created for the, the, the whole coordination. Uh, and with that transparency, communication um, simply got better. We have this clash detection thing. That's a big value because there were clashes and what you saw that were pipes going through, you know, things. Of course, they would have, I think they, they, they would have found a solution anyway in down there, you know, just cut it off, make it there and some things like that. But that's not the, the good way to, of, of designing things. Um, it's a simplified representation of complex re, uh, relationships. Um, yeah, I like the last one, by the way. It just looks awesome. That's his words, not mine. So what we are go uh, doing now is, um, you remember we started with that small part here. I hope, yeah, that's visible. And um, the project is, is going on, and we are currently working on the workshop area. And this is how, it's, how it looks like. So we are in the process, and we started you know, modeling everything, every equipment and every geometry which is going to be there is either modeled by us, or we just take uh, other 3D models and coordinate them spatially. Of course, it's not working again. So would you apply BIM in mining? Hands up for yes. Oh, all right. Very good. So. That's actually it. If you like to connect, that's a QR code. This works for LinkedIn. <laughs> this one works. A couple of questions. What is the source and nature of the radioactive waste? you're dealing with? I'm not quite sure. Um, what I've heard is medical waste, uh, part of it. So it's kind of the, the low radioactive waste. But honestly, I'm not informed <laughs> Well, that. You're, you're probably aware of uh, the public and political controversies in this country concerning, say, the WIP project in uh, New Mexico and Yucca Mountain in Nevada. How do the inhabitants of the former East Germany or green groups in general feel about radioactive waste <laughs> repositories? <laughs> oh yeah. So for the uh, high radioactive waste, that's, that's a big deal. There's still no final repository in Germany found for um, this kind of waste. For this one, for low radioactive waste, and this is why I have to uh, kind of sign in all my slides and everything that I write to the client because they, had, they want to check it. And the emphasis, uh, uh, they emphasize that this is the first official. It was, there was like, you know, a lot of hearings, public engagement, blah, 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 blah. So, and in the end, there was a decision, okay, we, we are going to do that. 
but for the um, high radioactive way uh, or a high high radioactive uh, repositories, that's a big deal. I don't think we will find any. It will be just transported from here and there and just left somewhere, and then <laughs> people will just forget about it. I just want to know how do you get the trucks down there? <laughs> uh, that is that is a good question. So that that was also one of my questions. They they're kind of you know this mantled into or uh, split up into pieces so they can go uh, into that. There's a big elevator cage, and they build it up down there. So everything, every truck, every um, every kind of equipment is built like that. And what you see, ah, it's not visible here. I mean, we, we're doing a lot of other uh, activities in that project as well, and we're also designing the inner shell. And there is a lot of reinforcement there, like tons of reinforcement, and banded in all kinds of shapes that you can imagine. It's all brought down and all you know, piece by, uh, 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 constructed piece by piece. Can you talk to me about, you mentioned this was a not one specific tool or software like Excel or GIS. And can you talk to me, though, about the software and the like level of training it might take to become a BIM practitioner, if you will? Oh, yeah. So um, my team, um, we are only BIM coordinators. And that, that is, first of all, people. So this is, this is nothing that you can study. There are like courses that you can do. You have to have kind of an affinity to IT and all this stuff. And um, the, the BIM coordinator has to have a real deep understanding of how a design process works, who is talking with, with whom, and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's just a training. And usually, I say, if, if someone starts from, from scratch, if, if there's a good project to learn, you can actually learn it in, in a couple of months and understand what it's about. When it comes to software, so we're using um, that's a, a big palette of software that we're using. We're using for modeling Revit, Autodesk Revit. We use for coordination, like clash detection and um, coordinating the models um, to each other, uh, Autodesk Navisworks, which is, uh, in my, it's a powerful tool, but there are other, other tools as well. When it comes to 4D scheduling, it's uh, Bentley Synchro. When it comes to visualizations, there's thousands of different software out on, on the market for architects. It's like either Lumion, Enscape, and, and things like that. So it depends. I would say software is the easiest part here. It's just, you know, a software training. If, if, if the training is good, you can learn a software in a, in a week. And then if you have a hands-on training in a project, you can actually be really good at that software after a month in modeling. Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions? Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you.